Hello, uh, I'm Hannah Vizgara and I'm the staff attorney at Harvard Law's Environmental and Energy Law Program. And this is Hannah Pearls, legal fellow with our program. Um, we're gonna just have a conversation about some of the work we've been doing following uh, federal environmental and climate priorities, particularly in regulation. And um, as we've been shifting from the Trump to the Biden administration, what we've been observing. So Hannah, thanks for joining me for this conversation. Anytime. <laughs> yeah, this is our first time doing a video yeah. version of a conversation. You can uh, catch our more uh, professional approach on our clean law podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep this very informal and mostly just be talking to each other. So uh, Hannah and I have uh, in the under the Trump administration, EELP did a lot of work to track regulatory changes or you know, a really ambitious deregulatory agenda that was happening under, under the, the prior administration in the environmental law space. Uh, and we were tracking what was happening with individual rules, what that meant for different areas of law and for regulated entities uh, and just our general protections and, and climate goals uh, as a whole. And as we've been moving from um, the Trump administration to the Biden administration, we've been shifting our work to, to look at the really kind of historic, ambitious goals, the agenda that has been set out by the Biden administration uh, and, and how, how the legacy of the Trump administration's deregulatory efforts impact their ability to achieve it. So I think what we'll start with is just chat a little bit about the uh, the, the sort of first week of the Biden administration and how they how they sort of set their agenda out and and what we saw there. Uh, and then now we're a little over 100 days into the administration. We'll shift then we'll shift to sort of talking about what what they've been able to achieve so far and how they've been uh, setting up their uh, the administration to to move forward on their highest priorities. So uh, the first week of the of Biden's presidency, he issued a bunch of executive orders, including one on the very first day that was the relevant to us and what we're doing, uh, 13990, I think it was, if, am I remembering that correctly, Anna? I remember. <laughs> um, and, and that's the one that, that really outlined some regulatory priorities. And he, he released the, uh, the executive order, uh, and it, it, he had told all of the agencies to review all of the regulatory actions under the prior administration for, uh, for their kind of compliance with their, with their policies, with the new po administration's policies and goals. Uh, and so all of, the, all of the administration's agencies have been going through this sort of extensive rule review process. And it also outlined, you know, really specific, uh, some specific rules named in the in the order itself with deadlines and and outlined a number of other deadlines uh, we also looked at a, a few other orders that were issued in in that first week as well as some other presidential memos and and associated directives uh, that sort of made up the the bulk of what um, how the the new administration was trying to implement its goals. Hannah, do you want to comment a little bit about what some of the first things we saw uh, uh, from those early orders and we can just start chatting about them? Sure. Um, we should flag that uh, Hannah and I issued, a, you know, we wrote a report that's now available on our website in PDF format. We can also, um, we have drop down menus grouped by theme. Um, and so that's all on our website. So if you're listening to this conversation, you can probably check it out as we're talking. Um, but I think, you know, if we were just to zoom out and hit sort of the big points. I think one thing that you know you and I talk a lot about is this whole of government approach um, to really every single environment, climate, environmental justice goal that was laid out in these programs. It's no longer just EPA trying to meet ambitious climate targets, trying to integrate environmental justice priorities within the agency. I think I was really struck by this full court press. You know, most of these deadlines aren't just EPA do this, DUI do that. It's every single agency we want you to review your scientific integrity policies. We want you to think about how you can direct 40% of federal benefits to environmental justice communities. Um, and so that whole of government approach to me was really exciting. Um, I think, and Hannah, you talked a lot about um, sort of the more specific roles as applied to greenhouse gas emissions as part of this larger rhetoric around really setting an ambitious goal in advance of the Paris Agreement. 
um, or not in, in advance of COP26, consistent with rejoining the Paris Agreement. Um, so maybe that's more, more your court in terms of so how they're going about meeting those agreements through these regulatory review processes. Right. So, you know, as Hannah mentioned, they've, they've now put out an NDC um, uh, in anticipation of COP26. And this was the week before Biden's 100 days on, on, on Earth Day, uh, where the administration announced uh, a goal of reduction of 50 to 52 percent. Is, is that right? Yeah, um, so 2005 levels by 2030. Right. So it's a, a rough doubling of what we saw under the Obama administration, which was 26 to 28 percent. Low 25 levels, 2005 levels by 2025. So roughly doubled. <laughs> right. And you know, and and that's a that's a big ambitious goal, and it will require a lot of uh, work within the executive. You know, branch within agencies, not just at EPA, to to identify ways to improve our uh, our emissions, you know, profile as a country, uh, and they also have some ambitious, you know, legislative agenda that they're going to try to push through as well. We're really focused more on what's happening in uh, in the executive branch, uh, just because that's where there's action right now, um, and. You know the rule. They they actually President Biden actually outlined four named fourteen specific rules in the first executive order, with deadlines for when he wanted the agencies to review them and consider making changes to the to the rulemaking that the Trump Trump administration left. And they've already made progress on a number of those. Um, you know, almost all of them have some. I think all but two or three, if I, by my account, have some action that's already happened. Um, you know, this is everything from, you know, they've got a little bit of help from the courts. It's not, not just action from the, from the, uh, from the agencies, you know, right before the administration, Biden, the Biden administration came in, um, the courts uh, struck down the ACE rule, which was the Trump administration's replacement for the clean power plan. So that's actually not even mentioned in the, uh, in the executive orders, because that was already, already addressed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's done, but they now have to come up with another plan for what they want to do on greenhouse gas emissions from, from the power sector. But, you know, we have, uh, you know, Methane rule is actually getting some uh, congressional action right now, and and the 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 worst piece of the two piece rollback of the methane emission standards for oil and gas sources, the the part that really reinterpreted the um, the EPA's understanding of the Clean Air Act and limited their own authority, uh, that is is in the process of being nullified by Congress, so a Congressional Review Act uh, uh, effort. And so the Senate has already passed their resolution, and then it goes to the House, and then it'll have to be signed there. But they also have, uh, you know, EPA also has a deadline for when to address existing sources, so that after th that rule only deals with new sources, the, the administration is also in um, planning to address existing sources this year. In fact, the deadline was for September. So we should see a new rule there. Um, do you want to talk about cost benefit analysis, Hannah? Sure. Um, I think that was one thing that was exciting to see. So there were only two rules within a list of um, rules that needed to be reviewed that had a deadline of as soon as possible. So we had the secret science rule and um, the cost benefit rule that applies to all future rulemaking under the Clean Air Act for sort of significant regulatory actions of the language in the rule. Um, speaking of federal courts, EPA got some help from the district court in Montana, um, which struck down the secret science rule. I think that was end of January. Um, we have a write up on that on our website. Um, but then with the cost benefit rule, we're now seeing, I think it's currently sitting in OIRA, um, a final rule to um, rescind the Clean Air Act cost benefit rule. And what that rule did is um, finalized under the Trump administration and it really limited um, the kind of science, um, the kind of sort of human health endpoints that be, could be considered when EPA uh, takes that science into account in its air rulemakings. And so if you limit what are the benefits of regulation? What are the scientific benefits to human health of regulating, for example, particulate matter or regulating hazardous air pollutants? 
then you are artificially decreasing the benefits of that regulation and that cost benefit scale. And so that's what this role did is it really tilted the scale towards deregulation in an artificial way by limiting the science that agencies can rely on, um, in this case, EPA. And so I think that is certainly a top priority for the administration because it's going to affect everything from regulating toxic air pollutants to especially greenhouse gases, where um, I think we saw in the Obama administration, they relied heavily on co-benefits in order to reduce GHG emissions because um, those often go together. And so I think that's where we're seeing a lot of movement is these really top priority areas where they need to get rid of these regulatory reforms that the Trump administration put in place that don't just affect one area of rulemaking, it really affects the capacity of an agency to regulate environmental harms across the board. Um, so that's where secret science came in, cost benefit. I think those were the two big ones. Um, and then we've actually seen in terms of so where the first progress is being made or where the agency, in this case EPA, is um, putting a lot of its energy, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to. <laughs> um, I think you know, we're seeing a lot of work being done on potent greenhouse gases like hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. A proposed rule just came out on that. Um, and we're also seeing work done on a lot of the uh, criteria pollutants regulated under the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, the NAAQS program. Um, so we saw a cross-state air pollution rule come out. Um, we're seeing some attention paid to um, particulate matter regulation. So I think we're going to see a lot of focus on these air areas in addition to toxics, PFAS, we've heard a lot about that, but that's right. where we're seeing a lot of the activity right now. Right. And, and actually the, the, of those 14 rules that were listed in the January 20th EO, almost all, they're pretty much all um, emissions rules, except for the uh, cost, well, cost benefit analysis rule is a clean air act rule. Uh, and then this, the, the, so-called secret science rule is sort of a cross-cutting rule for EPA, but the others were all emissions. And I, and I will point out also the methane rule is also one of those that had broader implications because it was the the reinterpretations of the law that they, you know, they snuck into the rulemaking there would have impacted any uh, emission standards for pollutants that, um, you know, the process for, for enacting them that the EPA would have had to, uh, to do moving forward. It, it, it established sort of a, it was their first place that they tried to establish this extra barrier to getting to, uh, to regulating emissions. Um, and, uh, you know, so let's talk about a couple of the other ones. So we have, uh, in addition to the ones we've already mentioned, the administration's moving forward with uh, addressing the changes to the CAFE standards and fuel economy standards um, and the mercury air toxic standards, the, the revocation of the appropriate and necessary finding. Uh, and then there was a there, there was a directive for the EPA to implement a new federal implement, implementation plan for ozone for NACs by January 2022. And that's one of the ones we actually, I don't think we've seen a much any action on that specifically yet. No, uh, just the cross-state rule. Right. And, and then uh, be before we talk about NHTSA and EPA and car rules, because that's a whole world of its own, I do want you to talk yeah. a little bit about that. Um, I will mention the other ones of the 14. So if you've tried to count with us, we haven't gotten to 14 yet. The other ones are all energy efficiency rules. And so there's a whole bunch of energy efficiency rules. And actually the DOE's uh, efficiency and renewable energy uh, office, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, has uh, has released its list of all the rules it's reviewing under the Trump administration, all their energy efficiency rules that it's going to consider revising this year. Um, this was a list that was that was requested under the executive order. We haven't, you know, all all the agencies were supposed to submit this list to the White House. We haven't actually seen them publicly. They're not necessarily documents that will be public, but. Um, this the DOE's list was made public, so we we have a little insight into what rules they're lo they're looking at, and all of these rules that we're talking about, we've created a spreadsheet that tracks the deadlines that were set out in the uh, executive orders and the early uh, or early directives by the by the president and what actions we've seen on them so far. And then we also have a second list <laughs> that 
you know, at the same time that the president put out his executive order with all of these directives, there was also a release from the White House of a list of agency actions for review. And this was essentially a broader priority list that the that the administration came into office with um, that, you know, these were the some of the items they thought likely needed some revision. Um, and it but it was beyond those sort of 14 first actions. And, you know, that doesn't mean that the agencies are only addressing them. You know, we're already seen from the list that uh, DOE put out that they're They've identified some additional additional rules that are, were not on that list that they want to make some potentially make some changes to this year. Um, but it is a really good way of sort of tracking what the administration is doing and having a sense of what their priorities are going to be, at least as far as addressing Trump era actions. You know, as we'll we'll shift in a second here to talk more forward looking about the the proactive priorities of the administration, um, but. You know, this this is a way for us and for us to share with you all um, how to kind of track what's happening at the administration. So why don't you talk, tell us, Hannah, a little bit about what's going on with the car rules? Stuff with the car rules. Um, I think the, the the context is this is a really important rollback for the administration because we know that transportation as a sector contributes 28 percent of our national greenhouse gas emissions. And so it's really important that um, EPA and NHTSA, which sits within DOT, has the regulatory authority to control the amount of greenhouse gases that come out of vehicles. And so one thing the Trump administration did is there was a joint rulemaking between NHTSA and EPA that constrained the ability of EPA to set greenhouse gas emission standards for light duty vehicles. Um, and it also eliminated California's sort of special power that it's traditionally enjoyed to set stricter standards above the federal floor, um, specifically for uh, its greenhouse gas standards and its zero emission vehicle standards. And so when you take that power away, um, it has a sort of domino effect because you have a whole bunch of other states that under the Clean Air Act are allowed to piggyback on California standards. And so this was, as a credit to the Trump administration, a very effective deregulatory rule, um, what's called the One National Program. Um, and then from that, there's a second rule that set um, new standards for the 2021 to 2026 uh, model years. And so what we see the Biden administration doing is kind of a two-pronged approach. First, restoring the regulatory authority to EPA and NHTSA to set vehicle uh, fuel economy standards on the NHTSA side and for EPA to be able to set its own greenhouse gas emission standards in concert with NHTSA and at the same time restore California's waiver, this authority to set higher standards. Um, and that is a really thorny legal question. We actually have a student, Leah Catania, who wrote an amazing write-up um, if you're interested in, in digging into that. Um, and we're seeing already, I think there was a proposed rule from NHTSA on addressing this question of whether or not EPA has the authority um, to grant that waiver. And then also uh, EPA right now is soliciting comment on this question of preemption um, of whether a separate statute sort of blocks EPA from um, having these authorities. And so there is sort of regulatory momentum there. Um, it is a very complicated question. And so we need to make sure that you know, these agencies are, are putting forth strong legal arguments that can withstand, I think, inevitable um, legal challenge. And so this is sort of a crucial prong in the administration's broader approach to reducing national emissions as quickly as possible, but in a way that is durable. Um, you know, you need these rules to last. Um, and so they're in this battle between getting stuff done as quickly as possible, but also doing it as thoroughly as possible and resting upon really strong sort of legal arguments and um, records. And, th and that's a good point for some of what we've seen about, uh, you know, as far as how the agents, how the admi administration and the agencies came in, the agency leadership that, that came in with the Biden administration, you know, really looked to approach rulemaking. They came in with lists, as we've talked about. They came in with lists, you know, identified 
uh, issues that they knew they were going to have to deal with right away from the Trump administration, you know, these sort of legacy issues, in order to even start to make progress on their priorities. And you know, the I mentioned that in addition to these 14 that were specifically mentioned in the, the January 20th EO, there was a list of a companion list of regulatory actions for review. There were 104 items on that list, and that includes those 14. Um, but uh, 104 items on this list, and at least by our count so far, I think we've got about 30 or 31 of them that have had some action initiated on them so, uh, to date. Yeah. Which and that's just the environmental. Right. Mode. This is environment. We're only talking the environmental energy, you know, sort of environmental and climate sector climate, here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a, I do want to highlight a couple of things that are on that list that we've seen action uh, before we move on to some of the other priorities. One was um, some a CEQ guidance document. Um, and this was a final rule rescinding a Trump era guidance document uh, procedures. It was basically procedures in order to issue guidance. <laughs> and so it was a rule about rulemaking. Um, but, you know, CEQ is really going to be key for their, for their proactive agenda. You know, they have to review, uh, they have what's not really in the list here, but um, they have to review the NEPA regulations NEPA from implementing regulations that were adjusted under the Trump administration for the first time since the seventies. And, uh, you know, that's gonna be a pretty major undertaking. And it also has one that has some competing interests because they've also got the very ambitious plans on infrastructure development and offshore wind development and uh, an effective, and, and, you know, process for the environmental analysis of those projects is going to be really important to achieving their goals, both from a, uh, the perspective of whether it actually does its job to consider the environmental issues, but also from the perspective of whether they can get their projects through uh, and, and keep moving forward on those topics. Uh, so that's something to look out for from CEQ, but it is not on those, not exactly part of that list, uh, as well as the revised guidance on how to incorporate greenhouse gases into the greenhouse, the analysis of greenhouse gas emissions into those reviews. Uh, another one is uh, the roadless rule for the Tongass National Forest. And, um, you know, Hannah, I, remind me where we are on that one. Uh, I, we haven't seen anything explicit on that one yet, just in terms of regulatory review. And I think they've they've just sort of pause sort of issued a pause as part during the during the review right on uh, sort of an internal memo yeah. on on a pause of road construction while they're reviewing it uh, and and then one more that I will highlight which really ties back to what you were talking about of uh, on you know how the agencies were were or how the Trump administration was sort of reimagining the law uh, in ways that had cross cutting. In, uh, impacts on different rulemakings. There was a rule, the pollutant specific significant contribution finding rule, which was first previewed in the methane oil and gas rule, uh, and then was was issued as a standalone related to the uh, the um, cont a contribution finding for greenhouse gas emissions from um, electric generating units. That was that was a rule that would have you know, added a whole nother level of review to EPA's process before they could issue emission standards. And um, that is, has already uh, been vacated. Uh, EPA asked the DC circuit to vacate the rule and remand it to the agency. So that one's off the table, um, which is, you know, pretty good for the EPA. Uh, a number of these, these rules didn't quite make it to the sort of locked in level that the uh, prior administration was hoping they would, and you know that's that's they would have. It would have been a lot harder for the Biden administration to start regulating emissions uh, if some of these rules had been left in place. So, with that, why don't we turn to some of the new priorities? So, we've talked about basically what we've been talking about is sort of the regulatory review process that all the agencies are under right now, per the directive of the president. And their sort of effort to repair some of the damage done by this really aggressive deregulatory agenda. Um, should we talk? Do you want to talk about science and transparency, which is sort of still part of that, but also right. moving forward? Or do you want to talk about e jump over to EJ issues? The EJ, the EJ one is a monster, and so I think we can do a right. quick, quick dive into scientific, you know, science and transparency. I think the 
Um, the notable pieces are that um, you know, we saw a lot of moves under the Trump administration to dismantle um, the inner workings, sort of the, the administrative architecture within agencies. And so this is beyond regulatory review. This is sort of how advisory committees are constructed. Who gets to sit on these advisory committees? Um, how is science considered? Who is at the table when that science is considered? When is that science considered in the regulatory process? And so all of these choices um, aren't necessarily part of a rulemaking, but they have a huge impact on the end results, sort of what an agency ultimately comes out with. And so EELP has a mission tracker on our website that looked at those types of moves specifically at EPA under the Trump administration. And now what we see with the Biden administration looking forward is simultaneously trying to undo a lot of that deconstruction and sort of build up those capacities again. So we're seeing, um, and probably the notable part is this is happening across the board. So this isn't now just an EPA thing. Um, we saw in those initial executive orders that Hannah talked about mandates that every single agency take a hard look at, you know, what are your needs when it comes to scientific advisory committees? Do you need to reconstitute those committees based on what happened under the Trump administration? Um, that's actually something EPA has already done is they've taken a clean slate and they've decided to eliminate all the members of two really crucial scientific advisory bodies, um, the CASAC, the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, and the SAB, the SAB, the Science Advisory Board. Um, and this is a response to basically the Trump administration did a similar thing. They cleaned out the CASAC and they changed the membership of the SAB by citing unfounded conflicts of interest based on whether or not someone receives EPA funding, even though federal courts have already found that just because you receive EPA funding doesn't mean that you have a conflict of interest. Um, and the notable part of it was that that change didn't provide a corollary requirement for folks who received funding from industry or regulated entities. Um, so we're seeing a response to how these advisory groups changed in the Trump administration, but also kind of going above and beyond. So folks are adopting the ethics requirements from the Obama administration, but adding new criteria. Um, we have a mandate that every single agency look at their scientific integrity policies and issue a report that describes those policies, what changes need to be made to those policies. Um, and I think we're also seeing a lot of internal activity, not necessarily mandated under those rules, but consistent with these broader stated priorities from the Biden administration that we're committed to scientific integrity, we're committed to transparency. And so, for example, Administrator Reagan um, issued an internal memo that basically said, we are going to protect whistleblowers. We encourage you to come forward if you see something. Um, we are going to take a hard look at our transparency policy and make sure that we are being as transparent as possible, that we're processing FOIA requests as quickly as possible. Um, and so I think you know, it, it, will, it remains to be seen sort of how well these policies and these priorities will be administered. But at the very least, we're seeing a lot of public proclamations that says this is what we're about now. And we are deeply committed to not just reversing the trend of the Trump administration, but also reinvigorating those commitments through new policies, new procedures, and making all that public um, so that there's increased accountability in terms of whether or not we're actually meeting those goals. Um, so it wasn't as short as I promised, but no, that works. Yes. I mean, there's, there's a lot <laughs> happening. And I think it's important what yeah. you, you know, to sort of remind people that some of this really is a reaction to what happened under the prior administration. It's not just, we're going to do something completely new. A lot of this is, is reacting to the sort of, um, limited, limiting roles for the scientific community and the rulemaking process that we saw under the Trump administration, and also limit more limited opportunities for who can participate, you know, and we, 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 they really kind of gutted some of these in advisory committees. Um, and, you know, it's been, you know, interesting to see them get back up and running and also being incorporated into the rulemaking process again, in ways that they were sort of cut out. Uh, and under the prior administration. So let's talk about the environmental justice goals. This administration not only made a really big commitment on climate uh, from early on saying it was going to have it as a top 
one of its top four priorities, but paired it with this concept of environmental justice, this idea that we can't, um, you know, we can't act on climate without also addressing the inequitable impacts of pollutants on different communities and other types of uh, environmental harms, uh, and realizing that sometimes climate action can have uh, inequitable outcomes as well, and that that should be considered in this process of acting on climate. So, it you know, I think one of the remarkable things that we've observed in these first couple of months is that this seems to be so much more than than just talk about this issue. That there's actual you know structures being set up and put in place in order to to push these discussions into the rulemaking process into funding processes into sort of the operations of the government now i would say it's probably very heavily the action we've seen is very heavily oriented towards sort of personnel and and task force development and sort of uh and report requirements as far as asking the agencies to think about these issues and and provide their their uh, expertise on how we can, how they could uh, integrate these these concepts into their work, uh, but these are sort of all foundational elements that we, you know, they they have to have in order to to achieve this goal. Uh, one of which is the 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 Justice Forty goal, um, and and really make this a last have a lasting impact on how the government does business and how it impacts communities around the country. So why don't you give us some of your sort of top priority items of what you've seen so far? And we have a whole piece of our our hundred days summary uh, that talks about this and, and goes into more detail. Yeah. I think one thing that is important to highlight. So when we talk about environmental justice, certainly addressing disparate impacts is a piece of it, but also meaningful stakeholder engagement is that other piece of environmental justice. And I think what's exciting to me is that we're seeing the administration, again, at least in policy in these public declarations and preliminary presidential memos say that this really matters. Um, we're not just gonna focus on equitable outcomes, but also early informed and meaningful engagement with stakeholder communities. Um, and I think that piece of it has been a long standing cry from the EJ community. Um, we are not a checkbox. We wanna be involved, we wanna be involved throughout. We wanna have a meaningful say in decisions that affect our communities. And I think at least in these preliminary presidential memos and priorities that agencies are putting out, we're seeing that. Um, again, it's one of those things where we'll have to see if that translates to hard action. Um, but I wanted to flag that stakeholder engagement piece. Um, I think the other thing that's really exciting is as you know, CEQ is developing its guidance around Justice 40, as OMB is developing its guidance around Justice 40, we're seeing a lot of agencies being like, yeah, but we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, so we're gonna identify all these places where federal funding or federal benefits could be redirected to prioritize EJ communities, but we're also gonna do it as we find these programs. So I think one thing that's, surprising but fun to see is DOE and DOT have really come out ahead in terms of directing not just millions, but in some cases billions of federal dollars um, in new ways, prioritizing racial equity as a fundamental component of who is going to get these federal dollars. How are we going to assess the effectiveness of these investments? Um, and then, of course, all of that is being fed and directed by a really deep bench of environmental justice experts. So it's not just, you know, the cream of the crop at the top of these agencies, of course, which is really notable in and of itself. Brenda Mallory at CEQ, Cecilia Martinez at CEQ, Deb Halland, the first Native American cabinet member. Um, you know, these are major appointments and they're being backed up at every level within the agency. I think the other piece of it that's exciting is that deep bench, they're not just filling environmental justice seats. These are people who are filling positions for which they are eminently qualified and they bring an equity lens to the work that they do. Um, and so I think for me, that gives me hope that a lot of these priorities and promises and pledges are gonna be followed through on because you've brought people into the agency who are committed to seeing those results. Um, so, Personnel, stakeholder engagement, 
um, redirecting of funds. These are things we're already seeing. Um, and, I and, think, and explain, you know, but I don't know that we actually gave a definition explain what the Justice, Justice 40 was. So <laughs> yeah. why, don't, why don't we just, for those that aren't following it the way we are, uh, why don't you just explain what this commitment is? Because sure. this is sort of a government-wide commitment from the administration, and they gave it a name. It's got a whole, you know, yeah. marketing back backdrop to it but you know tell us tell us what the justice justice 40 initiative is sure i think this is a really fundamental piece of the administration's environmental justice agenda um, the justice 40 initiative promises to direct 40 percent of all federal benefits that's the language in the executive order towards disadvantaged communities um, and omb and ceq are developing plans that hopefully will define a little bit more you know, which benefits are included, who qualifies as a disadvantaged community. But the idea is to reinvest in communities that have experienced historic and even present disinvestment in enforcement, in infrastructure, in um, the ability to access federal programs. And that commitment is married with actually the racial equity executive order, which I think doesn't get a lot of play in environmental circles. But one of the mandates in that order was to create for every federal agency an equity plan. And that plan has to look at, are there any existing barriers? Are there things that keep disadvantaged communities from being able to access or participate in federal benefits? And so at the same time that we're gonna identify new ways of directing federal money and programs and subcontracts and loans towards disadvantaged communities, we're all gonna sort of look at what's keeping those communities from historically being able to access federal benefits. And so hopefully, by tackling it from both ends, you'll get a really effective Justice 40 program. Um, and I think what we're gonna be looking for in the next few months is, you know, who has identified the programs that can be used towards this 40% goal, what benefits are gonna be included, who qualifies, and how easily are communities able to access those benefits directly um, versus seeing those federal monies get sort of diluted in the process of allocating them. Um, so that, that's sort of where the rubber meets the road. That's where the, the devil's in the details. But as a commitment, it's a really extraordinary, unprecedented way of um, tackling this historic disinvestment in EJ communities. So we're I'm, I'm not quite sure how long we've been going now. I'm probably a good half too hour long. or so. Um, so we may not want to touch on too much else, but we've not even come close to hitting all of the topics. Uh, you know, there's some other major ones that I'll mention. And if you feel like we should talk about, just tell me to talk about them. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, one is, uh, you know, the, some of the other major actions happening right now is uh, the review of energy leasing and permitting. Um, the Department of the Interior is reviewing their entire program for oil and gas leasing and permitting and what they, uh, you know, for both priorities of, of how they should address uh, land use and, and, you know, in compliance with the new policies of the new administration. We really don't know what's going to come out of that yet, but we have seen some, some, you know, first steps in action towards the, you know, developing these issues. Uh, you know, the, the administration has held some webinars and open forums, kind of public forums on the topic and initiated uh, not really a, a formal public comment process, but an informal information gathering process of, you know, asking people to submit information they think should be, you know, considered in this process. And they've had some targeted and actually going back to EJ, they've had some targeted discussions with, uh, you know, tr traditionally, you know, concerned groups around the use of federal lands and public lands for uh, oil and gas development and, you know, just sought to get their input from the get-go on what they should be considering. And, you know, some of that, I've, I watched a, a sort of a day long or afternoon long uh, public forum that they did on this. And a lot of it, it seems, you know, at that level, you can only go so far and they're relatively superficial, but these are, you know, they're, they're creating new opportunities for engagement. These really did seem like uh, discussions that we're going to continue uh, with the agency. And it's still early days to see what comes of that. This is of course um, a really major 
effort and one that will likely uh, is already attracting um, a lot of interest in, in litigation <laughs> and challenges. So, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it because honestly, we don't really know what they're going to do yet. And it's still pretty early. And leasing is still, you know, permitting is, uh, excuse me, is still continuing for existing leases. So, uh, you know, activity is still, still moving forward. Uh, this really, the, the pause only addresses uh, new, new leases uh, and new permits. So, uh, well, sorry, new leases. And, you know, we don't really know what the, what the agency is going to come out with. Uh, and at the same time that they're doing that, they're looking at oil and gas leasing and the procedures and processes around their permanent permitting program. They're also really pushing forward on a, um, some very specifically laid out ambitious goals for offshore wind. And that's actually something that came out later, you know, just in the last month. Uh, the government, the you know, the White House sort of laid down some some numbers <laughs> and said we want a certain percentage of offshore wind, we want a certain number of construction operating permits uh, to be approved by a certain time. So I think it's 16 by 2025. They have this. 30 megawatts of offshore wind by 30, 2030 goal that they're trying to move towards. And you got to remember that there's basically none of that right now. We have no real significant offshore wind in federal waters um, or anywhere really, but federal waters is what we're talking about here. Um, so these are ambitious goals, but they are, you know, we've, we've already seen quite a bit of action moving towards them. One, you know, the Vineyard Wind Project, which is the furthest along in the process, has moved to the next stage. We're waiting for, uh, you know, final approval of its construction operating permit, but it already, it, it was, its environmental impacts uh, statement had been held up under the prior administration, and there's been a whole history of that. We have a number of pieces that talk about it on our website, um, but that's now, we're over that hump, so we're moving forward. Of course, there could easily be challenges to these to these things in court and that will be something the administration will have to deal with but beyond that they've already announced a number of other projects that they're reviewing i think there's four projects now that are you know they're they're starting the environmental assessment project for uh process for their for construction operating per permits for three or four additional uh major major offshore wind facilities so there's action moving forward there. They're also talk, moving on in that direction from the infrastructure development side of things, uh, you know, funding towards onshore support and job training and, and things along those lines. All of this was part of their big American jobs plan that was released recently. And we're not going to go into detail about that. There's so much in there to talk about. And a lot of it w is also dependent on funding from Congress as well. Um, but there's there's a lot of a lot of action in that area. Uh, another item that I think is probably probably not we don't have time to really go into it in detail, but but worth mentioning is you know there's action happening at the the more independent agencies as well. So the SEC is one that I follow very closely, and you know while that isn't as directly connected to uh, the president's directives because he doesn't have the same level of control over their activity, their regulatory activity, their leadership has changed uh, as a result of the election. And that has kicked off a really dramatic shift in priorities and climate risk disclosure is one of their top priorities right now. So they're, review they're incorporating concerns over uh, how companies are are looking at climate change and assessing it uh, for the purpose of their own, you know, risks and potential opportunities, and you know, reassessing their examination procedures, their enforcement procedures, prior guidance. Uh, potentially, they've opened up a com public comment period that also includes the potential for new regulation, new, you know, prescriptive requirements on uh, on climate change in public company disclosures. So there's these whole, and there's a number, number of other actions in that area, and there's a whole bunch of things happening there. We actually do have um, a page and, and chart that tracks that on our website as well, and we can include that in the notes for this, this video. Uh, so there's action happening all over the place, and I actually should, should also mention that you know, even at FERC, there's there's action. I'm not the expert on FERC, and and Hannah and I will always direct everyone to Ari Pesco in our office to talk about FERC. But you know, they are taking a look. Uh, they've made clear 
that he tells me that the, the FERC has made clear that they will be directing their efforts to facilitating clean, the clean energy transition and, and sort of reconsidering, or I, I don't know if they're officially reconsidering, but you know, listening to some of the concerns uh, related to some of their prior, admitted, prior decisions that might have made it, created additional barriers to integration of renewables into the system. So that's all I can say on FERC. Uh, go, go look at Ari Pesco's work for more. Uh, but these are just some of the other priorities we're seeing. So it really does, you know, push down into s so many more agencies than the EPA. You know, EPA is a big part of the environmental program and the, the administration's plans for getting to their, their climate goal, hitting their climate goals. But, you know, every agency is involved. We've seen tremendous a action from DOE, DOT, SEC, you know, pretty much any agency you, you name, there's, there's something happening. There's, there's a climate counselor at Treasury now. There are new positions in all kinds of areas uh, that you didn't necessarily think of as you know, really directly incorporating these issues into their work. Um, and so I, I think if nothing else, we can say that the new administration is, is acting on its promise to make this a whole of government approach you know, what these new positions and new people in these places really mean from a, from, you know, a results perspective and what they are able to achieve is, you know, we're still kind of early in the, early in the process, but, it, you know, even to have these considerations integrated in a different way into the work that different agencies are doing is a different approach than what we've seen before. So I don't know, Hannah, if you want to have some other, other items we should touch on, or maybe just sort of wrap up comments. I think just flag maybe um, maybe you can talk to wrap us up about what kind of resources the ELP will be providing moving forward. You know, so we've, we've done our big sort of week one EO assessment, executive order assessment. We have this hundred days report that looks at progress made so far on those initial promises. So um, maybe you know talk a bit about how we see EELP contributing to this conversation going forward as the administration's goals become a little more concrete. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So, I mean, we're going to continue to track these developments, analyze these developments. Um, you know, and we have, as part of our 100 days report, we have this sort of spreadsheet bonanza thing going that um, <laughs> is, is helpful for tracking some of these early, you know, what's happening on these early identified priorities and really specific direction directives. But we also have a, a page up already that is uh, where we're going to kind of chronicle and keep track of all of our analytical work on particular topics and rules and, and new priorities. Um, we have a, an environmental governance page on our website that all, where all of these things are linked from, uh, and we'll include that in in the um, in the description of this of this uh, video, uh, and so you know, keep coming back, keep looking for stuff from us. We will be updating our charts regularly. We have a uh, regulatory tracker email list that we will be sharing all of these analyses through uh, as we develop them, as well as our uh, ELP news uh, list, which is a more general uh, coverage of other other work that we do at the organization. So we encourage you to sign up for both of those emails as well. Um, what else should I, should I highlight, Hannah? Second. I think I just um, wanted to flag that everything that we've talked about, especially the, the regulatory tracker work um, is built on students. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, Hannah and I get to have this conversation, but I, I just wanted to flag um, and thank all of the students who, who really made that work possible. It's an enormous lift to keep tabs on everything. And so um, certainly that work would not exist without student researchers who, who yeah. do an amazing job. Um, and also- they, our, and they, they track not only our, they, they not only help us just keep track of information, but they do their own writing and scholarship with us. Uh, and so you'll see on some of these pages I mentioned that a lot of the pieces are actually authored by our students, you know, working with us, but they are tremendously capable and um, and have some really interesting insights that, that have proven to be a huge addition to our work. Yeah. So if you're a student and you've made it this far um, yeah. in the conversation, one, kudos, because um, the semester is probably over. And two, if you're interested in working with us, you should definitely reach out. Um, and also just 
I think, um, flagging our comms team and Robin and Jess and Kira Davies and Sarah Levy. I mean, there's there's a an army of people who who make that work possible, and their faces aren't here, um, but they contribute. So I just wanted to flag that. Um, otherwise, if you're listening and you've gotten this far, thank you. And um, if you have ideas, you can always email us. And we love hearing from folks, especially if you're using these resources. We love to hear from you, how you're using them. Do you have feedback and ideas on how we can make them better? Um, that's all really helpful feedback. Absolutely. Absolutely. Otherwise, that's all I got. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think um, if anybody's made it this far, I am impressed because uh, this was a little dense, but it was fun for us. I hope it was fun for, for some, uh, some of you as well. And um, this was also our first time trying to do a, a, you know, Zoom style video recording uh, conversation about our work. So we'll hope, hopefully do some more of these in the future and additional updates, maybe in a little more concise version next time around. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.